Liz, why don't you talk a little bit about Alibris and then Ryan a little bit about what Lulu is. You know, one of the things Danny talked about and also um, Mike talked about is kind of a need for self-awareness. What are you after here? You know, and then what is the kind of media and engineering function I'm trying to chase here? So talk a little about what Alibris is and what APIs meant inside your business. Great. Um, Alibris, you mostly know for our retail site, we have alibris.com where there's over 120 million books, music, and movies available from 12,000 sellers all over the world. We also have another part of our business where we make that inventory available through business partnerships to other major retailers all over the world. Uh, And because we have all those sellers, we have a part of our business that supports the sellers and helps them make their inventory available on the marketplaces we support, but also the other major marketplaces such as Amazon and Half. Okay, and Ryan? So, um, Lulu is actually trying to change the publishing industry. Is that mic on? Uh, no. Look at the bottom. Oh, okay. <laughs> is it on now? <laughs> I say. Sorry. Uh, All right. Lulu is attempting to kind of change the publishing industry. So, if you look at publishing, it's been around hundreds of years, uh, and it's set up for a market where You have to get a book into a bookstore, and it's a very challenging experience. Today, with print-on-demand technology, we don't need to to charge authors the same way that we always have. So if anybody's ever written a book, it's a grueling process. And at the end of it, the author gets about uh, 10 to 15% of of the price of the book. With Lulu, it's a much easier process, and the author gets 80% of the price of the book. So the idea is to basically change the way that we pass knowledge from generation to generation. Okay, so you have a new publishing model in a sense, you have a different kind of media business. Yes. What's the business problem you face? In part, exposure, knowledge, awareness, you don't have a lot of money for marketing. Is this why you do APIs? Why do you do APIs? APIs are actually a really easy answer for us. Um, If you look at the standard traditional publishing industry, they are kind of the gatekeeper to getting a book out the door. And the problem there is, if you think about how many Economics 101 textbooks there are in the US, there are five. There are five Economics 101 textbooks in the area, or in the US, because there are five textbooks publishers in the US. And none of them want to cannibalize their market. What Lulu has is we can't go after all of the college professors who can write an Economics 101 textbook so the idea behind the APIs is to basically foster a large, uh, a large ecology of small and medium-sized publishers who basically take on that process of finding, vetting the authors, and then getting their books onto Amazon, onto the iPad, into a Libris, uh, et cetera. And you swarm the man? Pretty much, yes. OK. Well, how's that working out? Uh, not so bad, actually. Okay. <laughs> No, I mean, are you, are you really discovering, uh, do people find you in some effective way in this? Do you uh, still have to market in the same way? You market differently. So in a traditional publishing, it's selling somebody on the book. Yeah. Lulu content really works for knowledge-based content. So one of our best sellers is a book called uh, E-Start Your Web Store with Zencart. And that is basically if you are going after a, a, an e-commerce website, Zencart is an open source. The guy who wrote the book wrote the open source system. You're going after his book. Right. So we market in a very different way uh, because we go after the, the experts in the technology. Right. You can hit a lot of verticals really easily. Exactly. Okay, Liz, you know, Alibris had presence in, in the web world. What do you get from adding this? Uh, you know, before I was having that kind of discussion about is this about changing the core business or is this about finding new things on the margin that can give you innovative ideas or subsequent revenues? How did you all view that? Well, we're seeing uh, increasing traffic coming from mobile sites and mobile devices and social platforms. Right. And there is a plethora of devices and platforms out there, and we're a fairly small company, and we want to have a presence there, and we believe right. that users are more and more interacting with the internet and with major brands. It's kind of a comment devices. on media consumption. People are on these smaller devices. They need very purpose-built things. It's, the context is starting to matter more and more. 
Absolutely. Right. A lot of our traffic used to come from Google. We're seeing that changing, and we need to be where the traffic is and the people are. OK, and what's attractive to are you using mostly in-house, or do you have external developers? So we've had APIs that we've made available to our affiliates and our business partners. And we just launched our uh, developer portal today, <laughs> developer.alibris.com, where we're opening it up to outside developers. Okay. <laughs> wow. Thank you, Scott. Don't know what that was about, <laughs> but yay. <laughs> And uh, how do you market that? How do you create awareness around that? Well, since we just launched, we're still exploring that. Right. Um, and we're hoping Mashery is going to help us. And again, uh, start small and cheap and build from there. OK, well, let's, let's draw a little bit off Danny's experience. What were the things people drew on? What, what elements of the content? What elements of the kind of experience you're offering did people draw on to build successful apps? Sure. So the beauty is we have content and data like SAT and AP questions Yeah, that's really up for interpretation as to how you kind of use it. So examples may have been if you're already doing AP study curriculum online with right. video tutorials, you can decorate that now with actual AP questions and answers kind of on, on a panel on the right. That's official College Board AP question questions and answers. So you have some interesting things like that from the corporate side. Um, but you've also got, we have things like test center data. So much like WMATA has the subway station lat long data where you can actually do location-based, map-based mashups that are really interesting around where you can go take AP and SAT tests. So it really, the, to me, the most interesting part is when people start coming up with new app ideas that you mm -hmm. never thought of yourself that obviously serve a need and we probably never would have, would have serviced in the past. Yeah, and also new geographies. I know, Ryan, you guys got business from the UK, and you were sort of conceiving what you were doing pretty much domestically. Yes. Um, in fact, one of the case studies later on is a, is a company called Before I Grew Up, which is basically a bunch of guys in the UK helping people to create their own baby books by socializing. Uh, the other guys do much better because they'll have slides. Uh, but basically allowing you to kind of send off to your relatives, come here and tell, uh, put into the book everything about when I was young, and you know, we can kind of create the book from that. Right, so create a crowdsourced yeah. book. Does this kind of engagement with strangers in other countries, other cultures, cause you to rethink what the business is about in the first place? Do you have to, the sort of theme I got out of Netflix and to some extent College Board was, we have to think carefully about what it is we do in this world. And we have to define ourselves broadly but also effectively to meet what the developers might do. Now, you're a startup kind of growing up in this world. Did you also have to go through that? Not as much with the APIs because most of that experimentation came before we got to the API phase. Right. So we've kind of, we've learned over the last seven years what we do well. And now what we're doing is taking that into the APIs and exposing it so that other people can do it as well. Right. Right, and Liz, what do you think Alibris is known for, and is that what ends up getting developed, do you think? Absolutely. We're known for helping independent thrive and for getting sales and distribution for the sellers that sell on Alibris. And so opening this up to apps and social platforms does both of that. It helps empower independent app developers, but also helps get distribution for the mom and pop bookstores so is, is that don't really a, have a way to get that otherwise. Do you see it as a consumer app or as a partner app? Some app you offer to partners so they come to you more often. At this place, we're at this point, we're hoping developers are going to come up with something creative. But the, the ultimate goal is to have people come back to a Libris to buy books. What you have is a fantastic catalog. Yes. Right. And so you want that for discovery. You want that for people to play with in novel ways. You want that to build a game. Do you have any sense of what they might do? Um, we're hoping that it's going to take off in the student population because we've got a really big textbook season. And um, I was just talking to Tim in the audience earlier. He was taking a community college class. The instructor um, told them he needed a book that was $90, and he bought it for $3 on Alibris. True story. So that's, okay. we think that we can, with that information, students can be empowered. OK. How do you know when you have, I'll play jump ball on this, but Danny, you're probably the, the furthest along. How do you know when you have a successful developer relationship going, and how do you kind of feed that and grow it? 
I think it's when you start seeing apps that you didn't build. Pardon? I think it's when you, when you start seeing apps that you didn't build yourself. Right. So I think that's really the kind of aha moment is when it's, and I've heard people from NPR and other companies talk about this that are further along than we are. It's like that first time you see an app on the, on the Apple App Store that your team of developers didn't build yourself. Right. Like that's kind of the most rewarding first step. It's like you've arrived. Right. And hopefully it, it really matures and grows from and that it, point did forward. you then take that kind of progress and show it to the resistors or do you just sort of let it grow on its own? I think so. It's kind of, and one of the interesting things that I found is if you ever do a focus group or yeah. you ever get 10 students in the room and you pitch a concept that you're getting ready to build, nine times out of 10, they turn it on its head. Yeah. You're just wrong. Like we thought for sure a game would be the best thing ever to teach AP. Kids yeah. were like, that's the dumbest idea ever. So okay. now, not only can you do that, but they can actually take it one step further and, and build it themselves. And it's another form of you seeing what you were probably wrong about in, mm -hmm. a, in a very tangible way. Okay. So is your metric for success kind of spread, availability, speed, revenue? You identified mm -hmm. all these things to educate internally. Mm -hmm. Did you then sort of create metrics and say, I'll stand by these, or just generally express them and say, we need a presence in all this stuff, this will help. I think that's where we start. We start with just kind of under-promising, over-delivering, over and yeah. saying, if we can generate some new revenue, if it's decent margin revenue, yeah. and we can kind of flood the digital market and um, extend our mission by reaching a bunch of kids, that's great, we'll start there, and then we'll get smarter. So then we'll start gathering analytics and applying them, and applying intelligence to that, and really, kind of blowing it out of the water as phase two. Okay, Ryan, I'll, I'll start with you, then we'll move down a, a line. Let's talk about risk management a little bit. You know, is there a downside here? Uh, a downside to having the API? So, you know, just getting into the whole business. I mean, you are giving up a certain amount of bandwidth. You are exposing stuff you might not want to. You're creating disruptions in how business is done. I don't know, you tell me. Hey. At least for Lulu, risk? we How have not had. Yeah, so, so, at least for Lulu, we haven't really had that issue. Yeah. And it's largely because, and, and in fact, some of the success measure for us has been our speed to market. Yeah. So, because everything we do from this point forward is built on top of the exact same APIs that we're exposing to the rest of the world, the risk management is is reasonably small, um, because I'm only exposing what I needed to build my application in the first place. Right. Um, so I don't know, uh, you know, kind of what you guys have seen, but from a, from a risk point of view, the data that we're exposing is the same data that I'm already putting out there on the website. Okay, so since you had kind of mutual awareness, you really didn't see much risk. You mitigated it that way. Exactly. Yeah. Danny? Actually, we did the exact same thing. So our, our first rule of thumb was if it's, if it's on the website and public yeah. through, our, through some app that we already built, it's open, it's fair game for an open API. Right. And that's where we started. Then you get into more potentially treacherous waters, which we're entering into now, where you start saying, what are some of the other things that we could potentially Yeah, expose? you got a lot more there. You got oh, yeah. years of data, people yep. test taking, overall test trends. Do you want to get into that? It's very valuable. I think that's why my, my flasher uh, picture applies. It's like, you just, you gotta be careful. Those are the times you have to think it through and really um, take, take the forethought to, to decide, is it worth it? Am I gonna be careful with this? Can this, can this hurt me? Is it worth the risk? Or is it going to be one of those positive flasher experiences? <laughs> I see. Is there such a thing? I don't think so. <laughs> and Liz, do you have the same philosophy? Just basically, we will expose what is on the web no more, no less? Well, the aha moment for me yeah. um, when I decided we really need to have an API was actually looking at Etsy and what Etsy had built. And they're a marketplace as well. And by exposing their APIs, their sellers went off and built all kinds of seller-oriented tools, which would be awesome. We want to deliver more services and tools to right. our sellers than we've got the opportunity to do. But we don't have APIs for that yet. So we started with the APIs that we've got for the retail site. We're going to learn that way and then look at what APIs we can expose to sellers. So in some ways, um, this is a way of identifying developers who can then help your partners, all these independent bookstores, who, let's face it, don't have a lot of technical chops. Exactly. They can start developing for them. So exactly. it's kind of like your own program is a way of identifying people who can then go on to create businesses for them. Mm -hmm. Well, that's very interesting. OK, well, I, actually, we're running a little bit late, so I want to move things right along. Let's give our audience oh, a couple of questions from the audience. I know you, you had a question, right? right. Yeah. I 
I'd like to take that one, actually. Um, Did everybody hear the question? You want to repeat it? Yeah, the question was, how far do you have to go in terms of building a reference application uh, to get the, the uptake that you want? And the reference application that we built was actually key to selling to the executives. So in a sort of a Skunk Works project, I had one of our developers build a little sample app didn't get published, isn't on the Apple Store yet, but we put it on the CEO's phone. He took it around to the board meeting. He loves showing this off. Everybody got the idea right there from building a really simple sample reference app. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? I do think if you have the application, it is easier to get more developers involved. The, uh, the Netflix graph that showed a lot of people, uh, or that showed a lot of, of applications, Without the sample app, you don't get a lot of applications. You'll get, you know, a hundred people to register, not two thousand people to register. Mm -hmm. Other questions from the audience? Yes, sir. How are you promoting your APIs? How are you promoting your APIs? I can take that one. So, for us, um, we started off by doing a contest. I mean, contest was our number one way of doing it. Pretty, we figured that was the kind of least expensive, highest return way to start with. Um, and for us, we could do it in a closed, kind of controlled way with the AP computer science students for us to start with. Um, but I think contests, hackathons are kind of the first way. And then the second way, which we're entering into now, is, is success-based search engine marketing, the traditional ways you would kind of market and convert um, web-based users, social and search engine-based. And that's really where we're focusing, is kind of focusing on the success of developers who have already done applications. We have not yet done any uh, hackathons or, or contests, although it's something we have talked about. Okay. I think that's all we have. One more? Yeah, go ahead. Jump in. Good question. Prizes, incentives, what, what turns developers on? We're a little unique, and it was students for the first one, so we did a scholarship. Because um, that has made sense. That's our mission is to help kids connect to success in college. So literally giving them a scholarship is a, is a pretty simple way for that. And I think we'll have a panel sort of on that subject later on after the break. So with that, I'd like to thank our three panelists, Liz, Danny, Ryan. Um, thank you very much thank for you your very time. Much. Thank you. Thanks.